I, my name is Janet Barcy, and I graduated from the School of Foreign Service in 1975, and I graduated from the Georgetown University Law Center in 1985. My trip was the summer of 1974, and it was to compare governments of Western and Eastern Europe, which were then the countries that were under, they were basically the, just part of the Soviet bloc. So it was very, very different times. Those were Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, uh, Russia, I went to Kiev, or Kiev, I guess, uh, Yugoslavia, Romania, and Bulgaria. Somehow through my family, we rented the rooms of a couple of the children. They were, it was in a home, and I think the couple's children were away at camp, and they, some, they could use the money, and we got linked up, so Steve and I stayed in these kids' rooms for a week, and I don't remember much about them except since I wrote that at that time, I actually had a contact with the U.S. ambassador through family friends, and we had access to the PX where you could buy things pretty cheaply. And I don't remember if I mentioned it or how, but it, it came to my attention that these people would greatly value bottles of scotch and other, because because there was some barter economy going on underground for people to get things done. And so I can't remember how many bottles of scotch I brought them, but I did as many as I could because they said they would use it to get a car fixed, get some plumbing fixed. I mean, these were shockingly new ideas to me. It never would have occurred to me to trade a bottle of scotch to get my car fixed. But that was another realization of how people were getting things done. And also, it was in that year of 1974, it was still, Czechoslovakia was still a pretty grim place. It had only been uh, six years since the Soviet invasion. And it was still, it was, it was a gloomy place. You could just feel it. When I was, when we were in Poland, it was a great treat to find a vendor selling fresh strawberries. So I bought a lot and ate a lot and it turned out to be too many and felt quite ill that evening. Fortunately, it was the only time I got sick, I think, that whole time. I can't remember how we came to know them, but they're very interesting, very educated, cultivated people who spoke French and English, I remember. And uh, and it was, again, thinking that World War II was really, I can now, being 67, I can understand, you know, the years of collapsing and it doesn't seem so far away, but was remembering that during the worst of the fighting in Budapest, the city was changing, the control of the city just changed, I don't know, daily, but often between the Russians and the Germans. So they said they kept portraits of, of Hitler and Stalin and the kind of the neighborhood grapevine would say who was in charge and they put up the portrait on their mantelpiece because it wasn't uncommon for soldiers to just burst into your house and they wanted to make sure they had the politically correct person on the mantelpiece. And so then they, these people also had a summer cottage on Lake Ballantyne, which is a little over 100 miles from Budapest, but they couldn't get there very often because they didn't have a car. So Steve and I somehow, we, we didn't have that much money, but things were probably not too expensive by our standards. And we rented, got a taxi driver to drive us you know, two and a half hours or so out to see their cottage at Lake Ballantyne, which was very modest. I remember thinking it was, by my standards, it was maybe one or two rooms. Uh, but for them, it was a big escape and it was, you know, on a lake. Uh, but the, Mrs. Frenzy warned us not to talk about politics because she was sure the taxi driver was a spy because we were U.S. citizens. And it was probably very suspect. And I still, and I also remember when, she was. She herself was very amused at how shocked her neighbors were to see them piling out of a taxi. He probably we were probably picked up by a young man. I think his name might have been Nikolai, but I really can't remember. And he shuffled us around Keith, and I took us to his apartment. He had, uh, I think he may have had a Beatles album or a Beach Boys album, and took us to the beach, and gave me a Soviet army belt as a souvenir, which I still have somewhere. But he must have been, we must have been followed or something because leaving the airport, we were searched. Our luggage was thoroughly, thoroughly searched. I remember one of the 
women searching it opened up. She made a great show of taking my lipstick tube and taking the top off and, you know, rolling it up and looking at the lipstick and putting it down. And we were searched for, I don't know, a long time. I don't remember missing out whatever flight it was, but it was clearly we had been marked in some way. We decided I would use seen very much as my guide, a book called Let's Go Europe. Uh, which I thought was a really fabulous guide. I, I Googled it and it looks like they're still being published. And they were, it was very accurate in terms of hotels and restaurants. And it highly recommended a little side trip to Sigishwara, which was this town where Dracula's mint house was in Transylvania. So it, we went, it was quite an adventure getting on train after train after train and ended up just a train ended you know, we just sort of got out and there was not much there but somehow we found our way to maybe the only hotel there there wasn't much to the town except there it said something dracula's mint house i couldn't find the picture i know i took one but it, i couldn't find it and googling it now it says it was his birthplace but i'm steve and i are quite sure it was the mint house and now apparently i don't i couldn't tell it is a world heritage site and uh, there's a Hilton Hotel there, which we both find really quite unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But it was it was quite an adventurous trip. I also one of the things I remembered later about that is when one line we were just it was hard because nobody spoke English in that area, so it was pretty much Steve spoke some French, and so that somehow got us through. And at one point we were in a long line. Some woman came up and grabbed us and marched us to the front of the line and said in broken English, pregnant women and foreigners get in line first. We didn't question it. It was a very strange line. Well, I thought, I think I found you could be very resourceful. And I was looking back, it's pretty amazing that I did all of this when I was 20 years old. I never thought about calling home. There was no texting. I mean, if you would make a phone call only in a dire emergency, I guess my parents assumed no news was good news. I sent postcards and uh, somehow I, you know, we arranged sort of on, I don't think we did a lot of things in advance. We got ourselves through all of those different countries. I guess mostly by rail. I think we had one, I think we flew from Bucharest to Sofia though. I, that is my memory. Uh, because with one of the flights, I didn't put this in into the uh, my memory, but I was thinking later, uh, that flight, wherever it was from, the pilots were flying the airplane. The pilot's door was open and they were wearing their just their underwear. It was so hot in the airplane. Uh, so it wasn't what you were used to flying in the United States then. Um, I just don't, you know, I don't remember ever feeling hassled because we were, except, you know, for being at the airport that one time, I, I just don't remember ever feeling afraid or, uh, or scared. I mean, or sometimes things were frustrating because you couldn't get something done, but I don't ever remember feeling not safe. Uh, but I thought, you know, neither of us, I just, and I also, I mean, ironically, for better or worse, because it was under the Soviet Union, I felt it was safe. I thought the streets would, everything was safer and, and you wouldn't be, I grew up in Chicago. And so I always think, you know, always looking kind of behind you if you hear footsteps. But there I thought, well, if there's any benefit to a communist state, nobody's gonna attack us, which could have been totally wrong, but that was kind of how I felt. Well, I did, I think along the way we, met just a lot of different people. It's been, I have to say, since it's been almost 50 years, I don't have a really deep memories of who we met except for a few kind of special people along the way. I think we interviewed government officials here and there where we could and where I could. I was traveling with a, a friend. And I think it just helped me, I think it really caused me to do a deeper dive into uh, the differences then between Western Europe, Western and Eastern Europe, which were pretty stark then, because all of those countries were pretty much under Soviet rule. Well, CONTACT was the Conference on the Atlantic Community. It was held every two years. It was run totally by students of the School Foreign Service, and it brought together students from 
Western and Eastern Europe for an entire week of seminars and uh, meetings on various topics. We had uh, breakout session seminars. I remember we took people up to Capitol Hill. We had to meet with senators who came in to talk with them. I was then, while I was throughout my time uh, at Georgetown University, I worked as an intern, intern for Senator Stuart Symington of Missouri. And he was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the Armed Services Committee, and what was then the Joint Atomic Energy Committee. And I'm sure through his good offices, we had a, some really high powered people come in to talk to the students. Um, so that was, I think, it was really quite an extraordinary feat when I look back on it to pull together having all of these students come. And we had a pretty high powered advisory board. We had to raise most of the funds ourselves. And it was quite a feat of organization, if I can say so. And I, we met a lot of interesting people. Uh, I don't, I didn't stay in touch with any of them, but I actually kept a letter from uh, a few of them that, spent, that was sent to me and my friend, uh, Steve Duffy, who was the person I was traveling with, just thanking us for the opportunity because they thought it was such a great experience. Well, I am a uh, a retired lawyer from the U.S. Department of Energy. I was there for 20 years, and before that I worked for a law firm for eight years. I graduated from law school in 1985. And since I've been retired, I've been very busy with various volunteer activities, I would say generally. Uh, when I retired, I've had basically three areas of, of, of work. One has been I answer calls several times a week to the help line for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, which is called NAMI. NAMI is based here in Arlington, Virginia, where I live. And uh, this is a national helpline that provides national resources, and NAMI has state offices around the country that provide local resources. I have a relative with, who's had mental health issues, and so NAMI was very helpful. And that's been a very important part of my retirement. I also am on the board of the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. I tutored, well, not tutored, I taught English as a second language as a volunteer while I was at DOE in the evenings, a few evenings a week. And I just think it's very important that people uh, be able to learn English and immigrants coming here because English really is a survival skill, literacy in it. I've been to West, many of the Western European countries that I think a lot of people visit. Uh, England, France, Germany, uh, Italy, Portugal, Spain, uh, and also I think the bigger trips were to Cambodia, were to uh, Thailand and Cambodia and uh, South Africa. Australia was a, a big trip, uh, and, and Turkey a couple of years ago, and that was very different. Well, I think it was just I think traveling always broadened. Uh, the mind. I know that sounds trite, but I believe it's true. I think once you visited a country, I always personally feel uh, closer to the country and read if there's something in the newspapers about it. I will pay more attention to it, having once visited it. And I also believe that based on the people we met, it makes you realize that everywhere there are people just like you. And most of them want the same things. They want to safe place to live for their families. They want good jobs. They want educational opportunities. We want governments that function and are just and fair. And so I think that's, I think it stuck with me for a long time. And, and I consider myself a, a global citizen. We're linked everywhere, clearer than ever every day how we're linked together. And uh, I think it was just a great opportunity to you know, begin to realize that at a very young age. You know, the Circumnavigators Club, I think in 1971 was an all men's club. And in fact, I remember reading uh, it, at that point, it was, if you were a member, it wasn't Mr. and Mrs. Smith, it was Circum and Mrs. Smith and Circum and Mrs. Jones. And it was, and the thousand dollars grant was only open to a male in the school foreign service. Uh, male student. So in 1973, an enterprising student named Joanne Monasteri, who I owe, submitted her application and just signed a J Monasteri. 
and showed up in the office of the school foreign service dean and i think that's my that's my understanding and maybe dean the dean of the school foreign service and peter crow arranged it but my my recollection and maybe this is all wrong was that the Circumnavigators Club members interviewing people were pretty shocked by this, that a woman had done this, even though clearly the rules said only a man. And so they gave her $500. And so the next year in 1974, that's when it was open. And it said, we will give $500 to a woman, but $1,000 to a man. I still wasn't eligible to compete for the $1,000, but I could compete for the for 500. So that is, Joanne paved the way. I felt very welcomed by, I mean, when it was opened up, I don't think the foundation representatives could have been nicer. They could not have been more encouraging or nice or anything. I, I think this is a new world for everybody. I think, I think uh, the coronavirus and its cousins will be with us forever and it's now going to be a matter of people taking getting vaccinations and because it is a global world i mean right now i've read i mean we have the united states is taking a different approach to opening its borders than europe and so this is going to i'm sure it's going to impact travel for everybody in ways we can't imagine and and especially for students i think they're I think U.S. businesses are suffering because the usual influx they get of foreign students in all sorts of industries uh, can't ha hasn't happened this summer. It didn't happen the previous summer. Everything is shut down. But even this summer, I'm traveling out next week, maybe, I hope, to Sun Valley, Idaho, if it's not too smoky. And I know that that very fancy Sun Valley Lodge has been severely impacted because they usually rely on European uh, students and workers, and they haven't been able to come, and they haven't been able to open a lot of facilities as a result. So that's a small, that's a first world problem. Uh, that's a small, you know, so you can't go to a restaurant. I mean, that's that's nothing compared to what other people are going through. But that's, I think it's, it's going to impact business. I saw today in the paper, school supplies for the u.s may not be what parents are used to because in vietnam and one other country the virus is spreading again so these are just small little things but they're going to impact travel they're going to impact commerce and i think that i think it's, it could affect just a small it will affect the program because people aren't going to be able to travel and and also just the members of the club. I mean, that's why they're the Circumnavigators Club. But, uh, the, the virus is, is it's, uh, it's, going to, it's going to be around and it's just gonna be a matter of whether people will take measures globally to, uh, and then also I would just say, my partner is an infectious disease specialist. So he's been pretty gloomy about this for a while and it's possible that you know the virus will mutate and these vaccines won't work. So there's, you know, it's it's unclear. I think the Grand Off program is a fantastic opportunity for a young person to travel and see the world. It's a, just a it's a, a very it's a great way for a young person to. I think also become associated with an organization like the Circumnavigators Foundation and the club, which are, is, you know, I think any organization that promotes and encourages travel, which is, as I said, by definition, I think broadening is a great place. Fabulous, it's still going on. I mean, I think that says a lot for the club and the fact that they've kept investing in it. I think it's a tremendous investment in young people traveling. I was really, I have not been following it uh, and I was just really, I'm really pleased to hear that it's still going on.